My name is Mike Althorpe, and I'm curator of the RBA exhibition A Place to Call Home, Where We Live and Why. Home is an essential part of us all. Our houses, flats, streets and estates are extensions of ourselves. They give us ways to express who we are, how we live, and they frame our memories. Of course, they're also practical. Places where we eat, sleep or store yet more stuff. Yet home is probably the most expensive thing we ever buy, or would like to buy offering a lifetime of investment, preoccupation and obsession. Throughout history, home has been an indicator of status, ambition, but also of desire and frustration. This exhibition tells the story of everyday homes in Britain. It charts why they look the way they do, who they were built for and how they were sold to us. A Place to Call Home explores a very British obsession and the ideas that have come to define how and where we live. It asks whether we're all ultimately living in a place we're happy to call home. The exhibition covers a 200 year history, starting in the 1760s, in an era that we refer to as speculation. The concept of speculative building by developers dates from the mid 17th century, and rebuilding after the Great Fire of London of 1666 stimulated the design of standard house types. But standardised homes and ways of building them really accelerated in the late 18th and early 19th century. The Georgian townhouse became a defining part of our urban landscape arranged in long terraces, squares or crescents. The booming economy from the late 1820s onwards led to further expansion of merchantile and resort towns and cities like London, Bristol, Liverpool, Cheltenham and Brighton. The early 1800s, or what you might call the Jane Austen era, was largely defined by a genteel form of urban living, with an expanding class of people keen to spend, acquire and entertain. Developers and builders provided houses arranged over three or four storeys with more or less standard layouts, for various classes and catering for different incomes. The merchant class could choose to lavish interiors from catalogues and new style guides. For others, the townhouse was a simple affair, indicating modesty and respectability on the outside. In all cases, however, the building type proved highly adaptable. It suited the means and extravagances of an emerging industrial and consumer age. The rapid expansion of industry in the 19th century stimulated population explosion and movement. Cities such as Manchester, Sheffield and Glasgow emerged with their own ways of life. They were places of production, factories and shipyards where life was defined by labour. Genteel urban living was not completely absent, but the rapid transformation of how and where we lived was underway. The speed of growth was such that new home building could not keep up with demand and was largely unregulated. People lived in houses hastily subdivided and in new blocks quickly thrown up that quickly became overcrowded, raising serious concerns about disease and having a detrimental effect on national prosperity. In response to these concerns, there emerged a vocal group of reformers and benevolent industrialists who promoted model everyday housing for workers and what we called the industrial poor. But it was local government regulation that eventually led to a new and familiar housing type, the Victorian Terrace. At the same time as this was happening, an increasingly mobile middle class pushed the city ever outwards, seeking refuge from polluted urban centres. While the better off could move out to suburbs, the desperate state of Victorian cities put pressure on authorities to look at direct intervention on behalf of the many. By 1851, over half the population in the UK lived in towns, while in Newcastle-upon-Tyne and many other cities, over half of families lived in just one room. Disease was rife and it became clear that action was required. The Public Health Act of 1875 required all new houses to have their own water and sanitation. The growth of strong municipal governments in London, Birmingham and elsewhere allowed the more coordinated planning of housing alongside provision for water, sewage and power. Some reformers, however, rejected the city altogether. Inspired by industrial model villages such as Port Sunlight on the Wirral, the Garden City movement called for cottage-style estates and green spaces completely outside from the city. It sought to offer an affordable housing type that looked after people's physical as well as moral health. Garden City principles influenced the layout of estates, suburbs and in some cases entire towns for decades after. The horrors of the Great War in Europe stimulated the building and marketing of homes for heroes to a public hungry for better conditions. In the 1920s, public subsidies supported a new boom in housing construction, and the Garden City idea was realised in ever-spreading suburbs. 
Despite economic depression, the 1930s was an era of great change in consumer pursuits. Cinemas, department stores and Lidos sprang up to support an appetite for escapism, window shopping and modernity. Increasingly, choice became something that people could exercise in what film they saw, what products they bought and for some, where they lived. Changes in the 1930s and how banks lent money made it possible for some people to get mortgages, putting home ownership within their reach for the first time. Developers built vast new estates in response. While many flocked to the suburbs, others embraced apartment blocks in the heart of the city, complete with Art Deco lines, underground parking and doormen. Whether imported from Hollywood or Europe, there was an appetite for new ideas. Meanwhile, some architects had visions of creating ideal cities and societies through even more radical housing ideas, conceiving of high-rise towers and cities in the sky. The years after the Second World War were unique in shaping how we lived. War had destroyed vast numbers of houses, and many more were seriously deteriorating. These pressures led the post-war government of the time not only to create the NHS, but also to make planning and the building of homes a policy priority. Housing the people and reforming society became a key aim of the new welfare state. By the late 1950s, Britain was in the grip of a building frenzy. Entire new towns and communities were planned and built. Fed by new roads, places like Stevenage, Combenold and Runcorn took people out of large cities and provided them with spacious modern homes and a host of modern facilities. New developments allowed architects and planners to experiment with towers, streets in the sky and high density living units. Physical change was matched by a boom in consumer spending. Appliances such as vacuum cleaners, toasters, hi-fis and televisions became commonplace. The home became a place where the future could be experienced on a daily basis. By the 1970s, post-war approaches and state ownership of housing was being questioned. Industrial disputes exposed the weakness of the economy, and it became clear that the national project of replanning our towns and cities was costing a fortune and leading to unintended consequences. City populations were shrinking on the back of systematic clearance, while standardisation and building had created often inhumane and alienating environments. From the early 1980s onwards, there was a rolling back of state control and provision. Plans and standards were torn up and people and their individual choices became central to a new age of freedom. Government encouraged those who rented to take up their right to ownership. Meanwhile, those with money rediscovered the charms of historic housing. A fresh new wave of easily available credit led to an explosion in new suburban development, with developers providing yet another vision of home. Estates of cul-de-sacs with nostalgic names and traditional skylines peppered 1980s Britain, accompanied by out-of-town retail and business parks built around the car. The car society had stimulated suburban spread. By the 1990s, environmental concerns led many to conclude that such sprawl not only ate up the countryside, but contributed significantly to carbon emissions and had condemned urban centres to decay or at best, use as sterile business districts. Continental models and urban living, and so-called cafe societies, became the way to attract life back to UK cities. Sociable places that provided a harmonious mix of work, rest and play were encouraged by policymakers, keen to attract investment and transform the idea of what city living could be. New public and private partnerships emerged around urban renewal projects that brought people of different backgrounds together. Yet, while city centres such as Manchester, Leeds and Newcastle started again to boom, families with cars and the means to choose still opted for sprawling housing estates. Despite ever larger house building schemes, prices had escalated and many first time buyers found themselves unable to get on the housing ladder and own their own home. During the boom years, the number of homes being built was still a fraction of what was needed. The current recession has reduced still further the number of new homes being built and houses remain expensive and unaffordable to many. Overborrowing and cheap credit have left many homeowners in trouble. Large areas earmarked for new development are on hold, awaiting economic turnaround to bring them back to life. <laughs> 